you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, the biggest thank you goes to Professor Hakima Amri, who uh, so kindly um, invited me here today at Georgetown University and to the School of Medicine, the Division of Integrative Physiology and the Department of Biochemistry, uh, Cellular and Molecular Biology, and of course the, the Graduate Program in Physiology and uh, Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Uh, today, I would like to uh, talk to you about ancient echoes and modern evidence, new frontiers in integrative medicine. Uh, what I would like to stress is that uh, this lecture would not have been possible uh, without the support uh, of many other uh, people and institutions uh, because of the research I'll be talking about today. Of course, a big thank you goes to... Um, the University of Vermont, then the University of Vermont Medical Center, uh, and my publishers, uh, Paul Gray McMillan, the EBDM for Luck, and Columbia University Press, um, and all the research team members that over the years have collaborated um, with me uh, to the research that I'm going to discuss today. Um, let's talk about the very first thing, the first uh, chapter, you could say, of this presentation, which has to do with the trilogy, let's call it trilogy, the three uh, main books I'll be referring uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, the first one, uh, Mind-Body Medicine in Inpatient Psychiatry. The second one, Critical Neuroscience and Philosophy. And the third one, Medical uh, Philosophy. The order, it's not uh, chronological because Medical Philosophy was published first. Uh, but um, I refer to these three books as a trilogy because there is a silver lining that combines uh, these three publications. Um, and the silver lining is the connection between, uh, as the title uh, already says, antiquity, ancient echoes, and the contemporary uh, research, so modern evidence. So one of the first things I would like to uh, discuss here is a general overview of the content of the book, the, the, the first book, Medical Philosophy, and that will give us a chance to um, dive in in the more complex uh, topics of this presentation. So there are chapters in this book that focus more on a theoretical perspective, and toward the end of the book, the uh, clinical research is what occupies most of the chapters. Um, so. Why is that a case? Well, there are seven main chapters plus a conclusion after which um, I have included uh, the medical research, the first medical research that I would like to discuss with you today. Um, and one of the biggest questions that uh, I have been asking myself, and I'm certainly not the first one uh, or the only one to have asked this question, is how much evidence uh, do we need to let me use the term, believe in something that research has shown. And in terms of evidence, uh, one of the first things we should uh, keep in mind is the etymological value of the word, something that comes out of something else, something that is visible, that appears, that uh, hits the surface, that meets the light, coming from something else, right? X plus video in, in Latin. And it is um, very much consistent with other uh, Indo-European languages, and even non-Indo-European languages, but uh, within the first realm, we can think of to shine in English or German, for that matter, um, that appears. So you're shedding the light. So something is evidence-based if there's enough light to be able to recognize that object. Now, of course, in the scientific method, um, scientific evidence, means that we are applying a specific methodology to our research. And so we could start from the usual, the, the principle of falsifiability. Uh, we need to verify whether our research can uh, be uh, formatted in a way that the question is a yes or no question, binary questions. And then we have to agree on what methodology we can use. And the, the usual um, randomized clinical control trial uh, case control, um, the, the meta-analysis, and so on and so forth. But of course, this is just one part of evidence, because there are things that, of course, are or should be considered evidence, despite of the lack of the applicability of such method. 
for instance, outside the realm of the realm of, of biological sciences, biomedical sciences, we can think of um, a question that could be philosophical. How do you know that someone loves you? Now, you can answer this question with a straightforward binary investigation into what type of chemicals are involved. Oxytocin, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and so on and so forth. You can look at some brain imaging, as in fMRI or spectra, PT scan, CT scan, etc., etc. You can look at physiological responses, um, either external or internal. You can monitor your cortisol level. You can monitor salivation, overall oxygenation, whether you're sweating or not. You can monitor behavioral component, how your posture changes. You can monitor uh, perceptual modalities and their variation, the way your eyes will react to the environment, etc., etc. But would that be equivalent to claiming that this is the evidence? Or, in other words, could we claim that all these variables, which we can straightforwardly observe, are indeed love? So, in other words, if we monitor the exact value of, let's say, oxytocin, the exact value of serotonin, the exact, exact value of our change in heart rate, are these things love? Well, a more rational response to this question will be, well, those are, for lack of a better term, reactions to love. If we want to take on a more uh, materialistic perspective, we could say that those things are underpinnings of love. They're underlying mechanism of love. But to go from this statement to claim that they are creators of love, they have a poetic nature, in other words, that all these biochemical changes create love, well, in my mind, it's too much of a poor philosophical stretch. So this is one of the, the first questions we can ask ourselves. And aside from that, even if we do apply the scientific method in the most correct and precise way, we should always ask ourselves whether, as people such as Wittgenstein, for instance, or even René Guénon had to say, this obsession, let me put it this way, with statistical and mathematical values are indeed making ourselves feel good, feel even better, in other words, feeling smarter, not because we really are, but because this help cover up the lack of clarity in the way they express themselves. Now note, by clarity, I do not mean to say that in the case of love, it's unclear whether we are perceiving love. You don't need any um, philosophical, pr profoundly philosophical understanding or, or you don't need a lot of scientific and academic training to understand whether you feel love or not. Even despite of the fact that the person whom you think is loving you might not be the best at displaying those emotions, but you know it within. You can ask yourself your question. So this is not to say that that is unclear. What is unclear is how this underlying mechanisms, underpinnings, are indeed connected to the manifestation of love. And I'm using love because it's something that's as vague as commonly understood. But the same could be said about well-being in general, health. How do we know that we are healthy? How do we know that we are indeed well? We can use parameters that are associated with the same values, patient values, for instance, right? Heart rate, oxygenation level, and so on and so forth, cortisol, we can use behavioral modalities, we can use questionnaires and surveys, but already at that realm, many of you might argue that perhaps it's too much of a subjective component that we are talking about with surveys. So in other words, it's hard to quantify on a more precise mathematical scale what we are experiencing, and that is precisely the problem. Now, this is just a premise, of course. Now, in the book, uh, I tried to distinguish and combine different aspects of what medical philosophy is because medical philosophy will be the primary source uh, for, the, uh, for the debate and the discussion we'll have in today. 
uh, in the previous one we already we already um, had the chance to, uh, to to observe. So chapter one, a brief history of medical philosophy, general aspects and application and epistemological consideration. Chapter two, philosophy as basic approach to medicine with hermeneutics and evidence based medicine, medicine sorry, and truth in method. Chapter 3, Between Neuroscience and Phenomenology, from Hegel to Merleau-Ponty and Natural Religion, and then a discussion on theory and practice of the mind-brain problem, which is the link to, of course, mind-body medicine in patient psychiatry and critical neuroscience, the other two books. Chapter 4, The Patient at the Center of Therapy, Communication, Perception, and Self-Perception, Search for Meaning. Chapter 5, which is kind of the core of the, the book, Complementary, Alternative, and Traditional Medicine. And of course, we should also consider integrative medicine here, but that is discussed in part two of chapter five, integrating, complementing, completing, with the placebo effect, I shall please, I will please. Finally, chapter six, Beyond the Realms of This World, um, some discussion on um, existentialism, postmodernist philosophy, Camus, Sartre, and God, where are we now? Alpha and Omega, um, Diagnosis and Prognosis, and finally, Chapter 7, Translational Science, with some taxonomic consideration into the the application of medical philosophy and how to uh, make sure that the research is meaningful to the amelioration of health uh, in the general population. The conclusion, again, is an appendix which is interesting and is consistent um, with what we said before. This book is a philosophical book by its nature. And adding a, an empirical form of research could be either a positive addendum or it could also be viewed as a limitation. What do I mean by that? Well, if we want to utilize the scientific mindset where by scientific we mean epistemologically consistent with that view, so evidence-based method, the principle of observability, uh, observation, empirical understanding, etc., laboratory elements of patient vitals, uh, randomized uh, case control, uh, clinical trials, etc. Now, of course, anything that's empirical, visible, scientifically uh, observable in the lab is good. But of course, we will be still prisoner of this reductionist view about science. Now, this is a very complex topic because we could say that this is very similar to um, reading a book halfway. This is something I mention very often in my lectures. Um, if a question uh, would arise asking uh, millions of people which culture is more, let's say, um, precise, smart, intelligent, um, prone to scientific understanding. And we could compare different cultures in different stages of their history, um, considering history in a linear sequence, in a linear manner. We could say that there is at least a big difference between industrial slash industrialized uh, I don't like the term developed because that has a, 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 a negative connotation to the being less developed. Um, but let, let's say modern Western countries, okay, as opposed to traditional uh, countries and cultures. So, for instance, without mentioning any names, which culture will be more intelligent, more signs? Um, prone, more um, um, precise and overall smart between a country where the scientific method has been applied uh, successfully so uh, for decades, for centuries in some cases, with a strong um, industry, a strong um, history of uh, technology, for instance, or a culture where Reading, it's not the primary way to transmit knowledge. And books or the internet, it's not even part of such culture. Which one would be the best under this lens? And a good argument that many have made is that you cannot stop halfway. In other words, 
if you live in a country, a culture where most of human understanding and research and knowledge is indeed transmitted via books, scientific publications, and other media, internet, etc., then only reading halfway, very superficially, will make you less intelligent than average. This will be equivalent to trusting social media to understand biomedical sciences, or in my mind, trusting pretty much everything that you find on media, at least on, uh, on the internet nowadays. Okay? Trusting that will be not equivalent to be very um, knowledgeable, if not smart or intelligent. Or reading books that are completely outside of the scope of your investigation. So, for instance, you might be well-versed in, let's say, uh, medieval poetry of, um, let's say, um, Polish Commonwealth, something like that. But you might have no understanding, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, but you might have no understanding of contemporary debate on quantum mechanics, for instance. Or you might know quite a lot about quantum mechanics, but it doesn't give you the depth of understanding in a field such as mm, neurosurgery, for instance. Although there are some overlaps, and we could also say that um, the more you exercise precision, specific understanding of that research methodologies and publication, then you could be more flexible in understanding other types of of uh, publication that are at, at least as complex, but they're not going to be the same. In a culture, however, that does not have the same level of um, media-based um, understanding and media-based um, knowledge, that we might say that this is not necessarily the case. So a person who never read a book in those cultures, it's not necessarily less intelligent than a person who read a lot of books, a lot of research in the previous one. Because the way we interact with what knowledge actually is, it's completely different. Now, in a progressively um, universalist, cosmopolitan um culture in the world, globalistic culture in the world, this becomes less and less different and more complicated. But what I'm trying to stress here is that not everything that is empirically valid, and we will see the difference between empirical, empirically rational, empirical, uh, mathematical, and statistical, etc. But not everything that utilizes the method can be considered the vast majority of knowledge, or even the only form of knowledge. Okay? And, and one of the things that I feel it's really important to stress here is how we understand what truth is. Again, that is in chapter two, hermeneutics. How can we find this evidence? How can we take out the truth? One of the common understanding of evidence is the common understanding of um, scientific development. How does scientific development occur? Well, there are discoveries, right? You discover something. And aside from the philosophical discussions on, for instance, whether mathematics is invented or discovered, what interests uh, us is the fact that if something is discovered, it means that it was previously covered, it was previously hidden but it was already there. So as scientists, what we do is unveiling the existence of something that already existed, that pre-existed us, or pre-existed us in the form uh, in which we are understanding it now. Which also means that we might think that our method is the only method that will lead to this discovery. But since the quote-unquote thing has already been there, there might be other methods that may be just as valid if the main scope is to finding that thing. So let's continue with our discussion a little bit here. The, the next image you can see here is a 
a brain, a brain diagram, uh, which I also took from, from the book. Uh, and my apologies for, for the poor quality of this image. I, I, um, I, I drew this, this brain diagram a few years ago. And so the picture might not, might not be very, very uh, neat and precise here. Uh, but the idea here is the brain thinking about itself. So we use our brain to understand a lot of things in life and uh, it's our primary modus operandi. Uh, thank God that is the case. The brain is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating organ. And of course, uh, I, I am positively biased toward the brain. And yet it's a filter. The brain is a filter uh, that views, the filters reality in a way that it's consistent with brain functions and structures. So in other words, without delving too much into um, neuroscience here, there's a huge difference in terms of mechanism as well as basic language between, let's say, what's inside the brain, the limbic system, for instance, those are just examples, and other areas of the brain on a cortical uh, level, on a cortex, especially the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, uh, as well as there are differences between uh, parts of the brain that are responsible for um, understanding on a linguistic element or producing language, okay? So there are differences between the Broca's areas and the Wernicke's area, right? Between speech as in production, production of sounds that, of course, in themselves will contain a meaning, a meaning that is understood on the external connection with another person, or the Wernicke area where we have language understanding, something that is made uh, insightful because it's contained inside. Now, in the, in the book, we are talking about multiple integrative approaches, and, and that's precisely why I'm so honored to be here with all of you today. Uh, and this is a very brief list um, in alphabetical order, uh, and it's an order that I utilize without any specific um, um, hierarchical value here. Uh, and I will not read them all to you. You can read it on your own. And, uh, but again, the, the other issue here is how you could categorize certain um, subfields as belonging to the same group. For instance, is it fair to include faith healing with shamanism? And are religious and spiritual form of healing to be considered big umbrellas for both or that are entirely different? How about dance movement therapy and music therapy? How about music therapy and art therapy? How about traditional folk and ethnomedicine beside the uh, etymological or para-etymological folk etymological consideration? How about bioenergetic therapy and bioenergetics aside from the historical value? and the work by Alexander Lowen. How about magnetic healing and mesmerism or animal magnetism? Again, beside the historical value of Franz Anton Mesmer. How about homeopathy um, and spagyrics or herbal medicine and phytotherapy? Yeah. Of course, we have a specific historical figure. Um, we can think of the more recent development with anthroposophy and by, um, biodynamic agriculture and Rudolf Steiner, but we could also go back to the roots with Samuel Hahnemann. And the same can be said about mind-body connection therapy or the biopsychosocial model. Think about narrative medicine or narrative th th therapy. Think about um, um, medical psychology or behavioral medicine. And of course, there are other issues uh, that are not just scientific, but also clinical and legal. So is there a difference between a naturopathic doctor, a naturopath, a naturopathic practitioner, or the equivalent, the German equivalent, Heilpraktiker or Naturarzt, with the latter being more common in uh, Switzerland and some parts of uh, South Tyrol, and to some extent even North Tyrol. And can we say the Heilkunde is the same as Neue Deutsche Heilkunde? Well, I would say no full stop, because 
the Neue Deutsche Halkunde has a very specific and very controversial um, history. But in any case, who decides what goes where? And this will be at the center of what we will investigate next. Now, before we continue, I want to emphasize that at first, it might appear that I am embracing a postmodernist, uh, relativist, materialistic, reductionist perspective when I'm talking about uh, these topics. Uh, well, the truth is that we have to be very aware of the sociocultural and historical context we live in. Uh, first of all, to be uh, mindful of our intrinsic bias when we apply the scientific method, but also not to reject all the goods that the scientific method in its development brought us until this very moment. Because um, I noticed that, um, especially in the West, and even more so in the United States, there are uh, two opposite and yet very much connected um, extremist viewpoints, uh, what I would consider extremist viewpoints. So on one hand, you have this uh, very self-entitled Western-centric attitude towards science, according to which the West, and e even the West as a category, uh, it's quite controversial and imprecise in my mind, the West is the best that ever existed and will ever exist when it comes to the development of science. So this is one worldview that it's very inaccurate and completely disregards uh, all the other uh, scientific discoveries in, in many other um, geocultural areas. But the other worldview that appears to be opposite is the one that is entirely postmodernist, relativist, and to some extent philosophically existentialist. A worldview that will criticize anything that is Western for the very reason of being Western. And again, they're making exactly the same mistakes. Yes. In the West, and by West, I should quantify. By West, I really mean central. And in fact, in the book, in, in the first book of the series, Medical Philosophy, I really emphasize the need of a central medicine. Because in medical philosophy, the attitude, the focus rather, is expanding from the knowing that to knowing how. So it's not just a question of piling up information, uh, having a series, a list of facts or numbers, but applying those numbers and understanding them. That's precisely why, um, as I said in a book multiple times, st statistics or mathematics are just one part of the solution. Numbers don't lie, but they also don't tell the truth because numbers are what they are. They're just numbers. And I don't mean just in a reductionist, negative way. They're wonderful. I think mathematics is one of the most amazing um, uh, all provoking um, fields that one could study and, and I, by, by no means I mean to attack the field itself but the way numbers are perceived very often in this western centric attitude uh, they are considered the only thing that is valuable uh, when it comes to knowledge so in any case the western centric entitled arrogant um ethnocentric, we could say, although uh, very often in, within the West, we consider the United States, despite the fact that there's a huge difference between European culture and the culture of the United States, the same way there's a huge difference between American culture as a whole, as opposed to the culture of the United States. So it's, we're not talking about what is better, we're just talking about differences here. But again, I want to emphasize the concept of central medicine. A central medicine exists separately and yet owns to both Eastern medicine and Western medicine. Okay? The same way as would uh, owe to uh, Northern medicine and Southern medicine. So, um, in, in any case, uh, a, a, good, um, a good quote that I have here is the quote by, by Chef 992, Beyond Therapy, Beyond Science, that kind of uh, helps understand uh, what I'm talking here. So, Chef writes, why then? Is psychology so wedded to empirical science? The reason must be political and economic. The intensity of emotion with which psychology defend the old paradigm strongly suggests 
that we are not dealing with open-minded science here. Historically, we have always seen that when an old cultural paradigm is dying and on the verge of collapse, there is a tendency to become more rigid in the old paradigm to just set up progressively stricter controls and to try to kill off new ideas and dissenter through the use of the regulatory and legal arms of the culture. We are seeing things in the United States today and in many other parts of the Western world, again, using the Western terminology as a big umbrella, as the old paradigm is being challenged professionally, politically, and economically, the arm of regulation and control gets stronger and stronger. Contrary to popular belief, the push to maintain the old scientific paradigm and the Western worldview is very emotional, as if that was a bad thing, <laughs> and is based on economics and politics. If the existing worldview falters, we will not be able economically and politically to exploit third world countries, indigenous people, the animal kingdom, or nature. The existing worldview has permitted and supported rape on every level, and unfortunately, psychology and the helping profession have contributed to that rape. Now, I included this quote to stress how important it is to be aware of that, of these ethnocentric views. I do not necessarily agree with all the outcomes that might arise from this view, uh, which is connecting dots that are not there. That's exactly what science is supposed not to do. Um, um, correlation is not causation, okay? although the latter implies the, the former. And again, emotions are what they are. And so it's kind of a counterintuitive thing here to, to, to understand, but it's also quite, quite obvious. So on one side, it appears based on this, um, this abstract here that um, there is an attack on other forms of knowledge that are non-Western, and these formal knowledge are predicated upon something that it's not, um, it's, it's not consistent with the quote-unquote old paradigm, a paradigm that, of course, stemming from the Age of Enlightenment has to do with empirical knowledge, with laboratory science, with evidence-based, and not relying on anything that is spiritual or emotional. And yet again, <laughs> the claim is that the 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 push to maintain this paradigm is very emotional in itself. Now, I don't agree, I, I don't disagree with the fact that this might be the case, but I also not agree that the other critical perspective is deprived of an emotional push to do that. And again, we're connecting dots that are not necessarily there. Um, and by the way, while I am opposed to globalization for the sake of globalization only, we also have to understand that good ideas are good ideas to some big extent regardless of who the idea was of whom invented the first idea um, now we could we could claim that ideas themselves could come from uh, from an, an elsewhere space an um, hyper uranium and neverland if you, if you permit the term so it's almost irrelevant who uh, was the instrumental medium the person who discovered it but what I'm trying to say is that both perspectives here are indeed wrong. So what do we mean by, by central medicine? Well, central medicine as deprived of the extremes on both sides. So a, a side that contains the hierarchy of evidence but doesn't limit itself to the evidence according to the old paradigm only. It's open but not too open to the detriment of the paradigm itself. And not because the paradigm has to be defended, but because it's a good paradigm, because we need scientific evidence, because the risk is that we will discuss all these different paradigms and never embrace anything that is evidence-based enough. Now, what I would ag I agree with Chef is that there's a lot of political elements in there, but to some extent, we could see here how both the quote-unquote right and left wing, at least the way they are, constructed in the West nowadays are both at fault for misinterpreting what science actually is. And, um, and, and, and this is also consistent with the attention paid to hypermedication, for instance, where just because something is empirically visible and indeed is empirically verifiable to act, medication pills, for instance, we cannot think of anything else beyond the utilization of the latter.
So I hope I, I made my position clear here. This is neither an endorsement from the perspective of postmodernist, reductionist, relativism, materialism, nor an endorsement of the quote unquote unquote, I would say, traditionalist old paradigm. First of all, because it's really not that old, it's less than, than, than 400 years old, I would say about 300 years old, definitely after um, uh, 1789, after the, the French Revolution, and definitely a, a product of the Age of Enlightenment. Sure, we could say that the Age of Enlightenment really originates in humanism, okay? So this pre-Renaissance philosophy, we could say that uh, with, with the exception of, of people in the 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 um, hundreds, I'm thinking about um, Marsilio Ficino, I'm thinking about Pico da Mirandola, um, I think of especially of Gian Battista Vico, with the exception of, of, of these personalities, there are elements of uh, tradition, traditional decay from the 15th century on, and the Age of Enlightenment is in itself a product of that decay. Um, but definitely, what we talk about, uh, what we identify nowadays as tradition is neither old nor traditional with a capital T. Certainly not uh, according to the views of a perennial philosophy of uh, Mircea Eliad and uh, Emile Mirzola or René Guénon or Julius Evola uh, and many, many, many others. Um, now, uh, tradition with a capital T is indeed what we find in Avicenna. The book that uh, I am quoting here, and certainly uh, I'm not the best um, person to talk about Avicenna's medicine here, the wonderful, wonderful um, book by um, Dr. Amory, Dr. Abuna Vassas and uh, Mark Mikazi, uh, Avicenna is indeed the embodiment of this golden age. I would say golden age for Islam, the Islamic golden age, sure, but also a continuation of the Roman Empire, of the Byzantine culture, the Greek or Roman culture, even the Unani culture, the Persian, Indian culture. So it, in this sense, it's definitely perennial. And this is what we mean by tradition, a tradition that does not um, have to be um, confined to the realms, realms of evidence-based medicine the way we interpret it nowadays in the West. And I want to stress this because I always emphasize to my students the importance of having up-to-date research data, all right? So if one of my students in, in my neuroscience courses or medical course or even in my psychology course uh, is quoting uh, data and by that I mean empirical values and numbers then by no means I, I, I want to uh, say that any publication is acceptable. No, I always emphasize how the last seven years will be the most important uh, to include in any research because we want to be up to date with the research. If by research we mean numbers, okay, the closer to the present moment, the better it is because the research is fresh. But something that has been discussed, been discovered, that has been um, published really and, and debated thousands of years ago, okay, uh, thousand, uh, 1010, 1015 years ago in the case of, of, um, um, of uh, Ibn Sina, it's valid nevertheless. To a very big extent, it's even more valid. Now, it's a logical fallacy to say that just because something is old, it has to be good and valid. Of course, we're not embracing that uh, this fallacy either because that will be actually a paradox or to some extent a more of a um, postmodernist existentialist claim. Uh, because it's everything that's against uh, the modern understanding of science. Um, so just because something is old, it doesn't have to be necessarily um, necessarily acceptable nowadays. But unless there is something that is published with numbers in the last seven years that appears to contradict that tradition, that by no means should we reject that very tradition. Now, before we delve into uh, the specifics of uh, Avicenna teachings in relation to Yunani medicine, Persian medicine, and Greek or Roman world, etc., etc., an area that I feel um, you are already very familiar with, thanks to the work of um, 
of Dr. Amory, uh, let me just quote a, a research, or rather a meta-analysis, that talks about um, three areas, the efficacy, efficiency, and effectiveness of uh, integrative medicine, or rather of complementary and integrative medicine in general. And uh, as usual, uh, the, the meta-analysis approach is an approach that should represent, as we just mentioned, the golden standard of any uh, scientific research. It is uh, an article that is um, uh, relatively uh, recent, um, although, of course, it's based on multiple, multiple studies, and um, it's an article that um, has several authors, uh, Wang Fun Lin, Mao Feng Zhang, uh, Qing Zhu Zhou, and many others. Um, and it focuses on the efficacy of complementary and integrative medicine uh, on health-related quality of life in cancer patients. So it's both a meta-analysis and a systematic review. Uh, I just want to mention um, the importance of remembering uh, the acronym here, so health-related quality of life, because uh, this acronym is used throughout the article, H-R-Q-O-L. And the authors of, uh, of this art article um, really use the term CIM to combine complementary and integrative medicine. So we will leave the uh, theoretical, semantic, um, and philosophical discussion aside for now. Uh, so what was the object of this, uh, of this review was to evaluate the effects of complementary medicine on the health really quality of life of cancer patients. Now, uh, some of you might argue, why, why should we pay attention to these type of studies, given that at, at first, um, we will, we'll examine the article together, at first it seems to be that the article uh, mostly focuses on overall well-being, uh, a well-being that might be predicated um, upon, um, upon uh, patient-owned reviews. And so uh, the question still remains, if our approach is a scientific one, how can we qualify and quantify a quality of life from a strictly biomedical perspective? So the authors actually identify randomized controlled trials which uh, involve patients with cancer at any stage by retrieving electronic databases um, um, to, to, pr to provide a more specific picture. So database with inception on, on um, February 2008, so qu quite recently. The, the main how outcomes were these health-related quality of life scores and related domains such as physical well-being scores. This is important because we always want to make sure that we link, um, we, we, we link um, specific values um, to what we're trying to, to achieve here. Now, uh, data from Globacan 2012, um, as mentioned in, in the article, produced by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, indicated, and this is just an intro, that an estimated 14.1 million new cancer cases and 8.2 million cancer deaths occurred in 2012 worldwide. So we, we, we understand the importance of focusing on this area of research as indicative of all the other areas of interventions that are related to it. In fact, the author specify here that because of low health-related quality of life, especially resulting from inadequate treatment, may deteriorate cancer patients' condition and even increase mortality. So think of it in a binary sense. Uh, there's a spectrum of effectors, but a binary outcome in a Bayesian sense. Um, the the, the health-related quality of life is a central consideration for many physicians uh, in terms of designing the protocol of intervention. So what, what, um, what, um, what specifics did this study uh, cover? Um, well, as usual, um, not, not nothing, nothing um, new here. The standard as mean difference was used for the analysis. Heterogeneity was assessed with the I-square statistics. And then a Bayesian framework was used to estimate the ranking order of efficacy in the health-related quality of life um, change. And finally, um, 34 randomized controlled trials were included with over 3,000 patients, which is extremely significant from a statistical standpoint. So the general result is showing, uh, demonstrating, although this word is it's seldom used in, in scientific uh, sense, um, indicating um, that uh, there was a clear, um, statistically clear superior efficacy of complementary medicine in improving such health-related uh, quality uh, of life. Now, of course, with any type of research, specifically with, with systematic review and meta-analysis, where 
uh, a team of scientists gets their data is really as important as the study design itself. So we mentioned GlobalCan, and for the one uh, of, of you that might not be familiar with this acronym, the GlobalCan is really the uh, Global Cancer uh, Observatory um, of the WHO, the World Health Organization, the, the, the international agency for, uh, for research on cancer. And, and that's where, where this um, study uh, got, uh, got their data. And also in terms of how to define the, the problematic aspect from a etiological perspective in cancer patients. And they follow the, the standard uh, PRISMA guidelines for, for sy systematic review. And in terms of, of selection criteria, which is really, really interesting, well, not, not interesting because it's unexpected, but it's interesting because it, it speaks to the fact that the concept of integration is entirely predicated on current scientific knowledge. So the selection criteria uh, was including um, the, 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 big, the big names of Medline, Web of Science, uh, Cochrane Central, PubMed, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, and uh, the, the, the researchers um, were, were um, interested in, in, in also manually screening uh, published systematic reviews and presentation from uh, other sources, and then included that specifically, in, or sources such as um, um, uh, lectures and conferences, um, confer always in the same area, such as the American Society of Clinical uh, Oncology for, uh, for additional studies. All right, I just want to mention a few more things about this article uh, regarding the, the, the evidence-based uh, results here, and I, 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 let, um, I let you um, review the, the, the whole text um, after this presentation. Um, in any case, um, in total, there were uh, 574 unique studies um, in, this, um, in these uh, search strategies, and 149 full-text articles were fully reviewed, uh, again, following the uh, previous premises, the PRISMA, um, and according to the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this resulted in a final sample of 34 studies. And all studies were two arm trials in which one arm is the, of course, complementary, the CIM intervention. Um, um, and the other arm, of course, is placebo or standards of care. Standard of care as in um, uh, standard of care without uh, complementary integrative uh, medical uh, treatment. Now, uh, of course, the issue of inclusion from a specific um, selection criteria is always problematic, which therapy should be included in complementary alternative medicine. So let's just quote the article here to see which uh, strategies or rather which therapeutic modalities the author included. They included yoga, AIDS trials, nutritional supplements, six, Chinese herbal medicine, four, acupuncture, four, Multimodal Complementary Medicine 3, Qigong 3, Mindfulness 3, Massage 2, or Qigong plus Mindfulness in one trial. Uh, I will leave aside the validity of uh, claims associated specifically to Qigong and Mindfulness and whether these terms, uh, especially in the, in, in the latter case, are too vague to be defined. But... Um, at least we have a clear idea of how the, the selection process uh, occurred. Now, um, uh, lo looking at a bigger picture here, these 34 trials were reported between 2006 and 2017 and included, as I mentioned, over 3,000 uh, participants. The range was uh, 13 to uh, 275, as we mentioned. Uh, and the primary outcome was report, reported in all studies. Primary outcome, again, according to the um, H, HRQOL uh, score changes. Now, from a geographical uh, standpoint, among these trials, 16 were from the United States, 5 from Germany, 4 from China, 4 also from Australia, 2 from Japan, and 2 trials from the United Kingdom. Um, now, the one trial only applied to South Korea, Turkey, Malaysia, and Italy. They each had one. And the age of patient ranged from 44.7 to 70.3 years, with a median of 56, across all studies. And 92% of uh, these subjects were female, which is extremely relevant given the um, uh, underrepresentation of female subjects in many related studies. So I feel that this meta-analysis is extremely, extremely useful. 
Uh, now, of course, it's also extremely useful because uh, th there is an implicit bias here because we're talking about breast cancer studies, of course. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the percentage of female subjects is, is, is relevant to, to the very nature of the study. So 20 studies on, on breast cancer was the most studied cancer among the enrolled studies, followed by, by, by uh, other uh, various cancers, um, seven studies in general, and then colorectal cancer for three, prostate cancer for one, lung cancer for one, and hepatic carcinoma for one, and also one study for ovarian cancer. Now, talking about numbers, the mean HRQOL score of patient baseline of, of complementary integrative medicine treatment was 82.5, range 20.7 through 152.1, while it was 80.4, range 16.6 uh, through 143.2 in the control group. Okay, so 82.5 versus 84 at baseline. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is after treatment, again, comparing complementary alternative medicine on one side and central care on the other side, the mean HRQOL score of patient in the CIM group was 87, range 24.4 through 145.2, while it was 81.8, range 20 to uh, 131.4 in the control group. All right, so one of the criticism or at least observation that some of you might have is, well, while these meta-analysis and similar ones could provide some um, evidence of the fact that complementary medicine can help in the overall well-being, it still remains to be um, verified whether this overall well-being is on a physical and or 
psychological, let's say, level. So in other words, whether these uh, therapeutic modalities have a beneficial uh, effect on the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral component of health, as opposed to the biomedical or etiological uh, component of the disease, disorder, or medical issue they're suffering from. Uh, so uh, another study I want to mention in this regard is, okay, what about those um, medical um, issues that are at the intersection of strictly biomedical um, presentation and uh, cognitive effect or cognitive emotional effects, uh, as in uh, dementia or Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. So there is one study that I want to briefly mention here, published in Jure Psychiatry um, a few years ago, um, comparison between traditional medicines and pharmacotherapies for Alzheimer's disease. This, again, was a systematic review and another meta-analysis focused this time on cognitive outcomes. Um, and it was a study um, um, conducted by May, uh, Fang, Hyde, Hugel, et al. And um, the main objectives was to evaluate what, what type of scientific evidence we have uh, for uh, traditional medicines, and traditional medicine specifically in, Asia, in East Asia, uh, on measure of cognition in uh, Alzheimer's and to determine the effect sizes at different time points for the traditional uh, medicine and pharmacotherapies. And again, um, the, the, the added um, objective assess the tolerability of traditional medicines. What methods does this meta-analysis utilize? They search 12 databases in English, Chinese, and Japanese for eligible randomized controlled trials that compared orally administered traditional medicine with pharmacotherapy and reported cognitive outcomes. Now, one of the issues that I mention all the time is when you access a database, it will be extremely useful to be mindful of which language on top of which uh, scientific keywords you utilize. So I feel it's really great that this uh, research included at least uh, three databases from three different um, cultural linguistic areas. Uh, Meta-analyses were conducted for Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, cognitive subscale, and or uh, the usual MMSE, the mini mental state examination. Mean difference and 95% confidence intervals were calculated to evaluate treatment effects. So, um, what are the results? Um, there were 30 randomized controlled trials, which met including criteria, 29 of them compared traditional medicine with uh, donapazil, standard um, standard cognition uh, enhancing uh, medi medication, although the, the name itself is like many other uh, medication in this area, a little bit of a, of a, a misnomer, a recept, so it can treat Alzheimer's disease, that's, that's uh, that's the main um, main um, focus of the brain. It's, it's in a class of medication that it's that's called cholesterol inhibitors, and it's assumed to uh, scientifically assumed, of course, to Im improve overall uh, mental function. So um, the usual uh, function related to uh, Alzheimer and dementia, so memory, uh, attention, etc. So, uh, again, this meta-analysis compared um, donapazil, and uh, the, the, the results suggested that the clinical benefit of a traditional uh, medicine were not less than donapazil at comparable time points, with both groups showing improvements. Now, so this 29 randomized controlled trial compared traditional medicine with donapazil, and single studies provided comparison with galantamine, rivastigmine, or memantin. There were no significant differences between the traditional medicine and donapazil group at 12 or, or 24 weeks for Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, cognitive subscale, or MMSE. Improvements over baseline were significant for MMSE at 12 and, 12 and 24 weeks within the TM, so the traditional medicine and donapazil groups, and remained significant at one year. Effect size were reduced in the three double-blind studies, and at 24 weeks, donapazil, 10 milligrams, generally produced greater improvements in MMCs than 5 milligrams. Tolerability reporting was incomplete and inconsistent between studies, so it's really something to, to uh, keep in mind. Why did I mention these studies um, if the result appears to be less clear than the previous one? For the simple reason that as part of integration, we should also keep in mind that... Um, uh, similar effects should be considered. Similar effects as in comparable effects with the same 
um, overall um, benefit, perceived benefits. So that um, that would leave a margin of decision making in the doctor administering the therapy. Why is that important? Because we we are mandated as, as scientists, as clinicians, to always pick the most effective treatment with the least amount of harm. So those studies are extremely important, despite the fact that they might uh, suggest a different outcome in comparison to the previous one. Uh, okay, another article, this time not a meta-analysis, not a systematic review, not even a randomized control trial, but simply a survey uh, published in the Swiss Journal um, of uh, General Medicine a few years ago. This was a survey uh, on uh, naturopathy, on naturopathic treatments, uh, focused specifically on traditional European medicine or uh, traditionelle europäische Heilkunde or medicine, uh, which is one of the the, the specific terms utilized in uh, Central Europe and even more so in Switzerland, Austria, Northern Italy, and Germany, um, which, which distinguishes it from any other form of traditional medicine. And it's also predicated upon not only the clinical scientific uh, literature and, and expertise, but also on the um, legal framework to distinguish the, the figure of the high practica, for instance, uh, as a naturopathic practitioner uh, from the Naturarzt or natural physician etc etc now uh, in this in this paper the, the term TEM traditional European medicine traditional European medicine um, is used in a very specific way uh, within this clinical scientific um, we would say anthropological cultural geocultural framework so the objective of this investigation was to classify those naturopathic treatment or other forms of uh, integrated medicine that are indeed considered part of TEM from the one that are not. Uh, the design included two steps question with a double evaluation, uh, Delphi method, which was of course anonymous, um, but it was not um, triple blind. And so it was anonymous with the exception of the evaluator. Uh, the participants were a smaller group, relatively smaller group, an expert panel with uh, 19 academic specialists in naturopathy, according to the rules and regulation of the Swiss Federation, um, and more broadly, according to the parameter TM, and five specialists in the history of medicine and naturopathy. Naturopathy, again, defined as uh, Naturheilkunde or uh, traditionelle um, uh, Heilkunde, traditionelle europäische medicine. Um, that received the first questionnaire. 15 naturopathic experts and four medical history experts answered the questionnaire and received the evaluation together with the second questionnaire. What's an intervention? The first questionnaire contained 20 questions, including control questions on a characteristic and relationship of alternative healing method to naturopathy or traditional um, uh, European medicine. Of course, these were uh, binary questions, so it could be answered with yes or no. But they also ended a depending, in the case of the latter, which a free attack explanation was uh, requested. So an added, um, an added um, uh, qualitative analysis, narrative analysis. In the second stage, a proposal for the definition, content, and argumentation of the traditional European medicine parameters was presented for assessment and comment. What did this um, survey um, indicate? Well, the expert opinion on the characterization and classification of naturopathic and alternative methods in relation to naturopathy and TM um, was uh, predicated upon the, um, the, the, the values of uh, development and definition. So a clear majority of this expert recommends developing and defining TM as a defined medical system with its own history-based philosophy. Now, uh, many actually uh, stress the fact that traditional European medicine should be more related to history, which is really interesting because I really want to stress this point. Uh, we should move away in the context of science from any attempt to, how can I phrase this, to uh, influence copyright-based decisions, as in acronyms, labels are important from a categorization perspective, a taxological perspective, sorry, a taxonomic perspective, but they're not very useful just from the perspective of branding, okay? However, what's the usefulness in a clinical setting? Well, the usefulness is, again, to have those very meta-analysis that we otherwise put everything in the same basket. So if you remember what we said earlier, were um, some um, traditional, and sorry, some complementary integrity approaches were deemed to be more effective or as effective without the 
uh, negative outcomes and we separate there uh, for instance yoga from everything else which had a negative impact on sleeping patterns even more so in the approach that we require the definition of things such as traditional European medicine that include a geocultural uh, descriptor such as European okay? and whether European should be inclusive of Germanic, Slavic, uh, Baltic, um, Basque, uh, or, you know, Greek or Roman or the close proximity United medicine, this is still up for debate. But uh, one of the things that this study indicates is that the, a majority of these experts sees balneotherapy, hydrotherapy, nutritional therapy, exercise, and massage as a content of TM, pedotherapy as, you know, Pflanzenkunde, um, we could say, as... as um, herbal medicine from a European perspective, but they certainly did not include electrotherapy and even homeopathy, despite the fact that that is truly European, as in it was developed in Europe by uh, Samuel Hahnemann. So it's really interesting that, th that the parameters here are not only anthropological ones or um, historical ones, but without these parameters, we might miss the point. So in the second part, many individual suggestions for improvement on the proposed definition and characteristic of TM are a reason to continue with this process because um, it is important to understand that this is an evolution. And just as in many other areas of um, anthropological investigation, there is a huge difference between endonym and exonyms in understanding um, identity and, 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 and cultural evolution, if we can use this, this term in a, you know, postmodern sense, even more so to define a form of medicine that is so geoculturally uh, connected. Now, this is traditional European medicine, but what, again, about Avicenna? So as it is well known, one of the issues, uh, at least from the medical standpoint, with um, uh, Unani medicine, more specifically with the system by, by Avicenna, was the, the, the very concept of humors, um, which is very similar to the attack um, in, in, a, in a figurative sense, of course, to, um, um, to the medicine of the Greek or Roman world. So... Uh, the, the, the very concept of humors as body fluids um, is one of the most most uh, relevant issues in the in the current scientific literature. So, um, one of the things that we have to understand is that there is a distinction between the way uh, this concept is perceived according to a medical framework that is entirely Western based, and even more so if it's American based, and even more so if it's United States based, from the way it should be interpreted according to the correct exegesis, if I permit the term, of Avicenna's work. Now, uh, as a general example within United Medicine, the, the way we interpret um, medical issues, both from an etiological standpoint as well as from a sort of clinical um, therapeutic standpoint, it's, it's quite complex. So I just want to mention one, one article by um, um, Alam and, 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 and Hamri that was published a few years ago on an hypothyroidism from the perspective of, um, uh, of United Medicine. An article was published in the Journal of Integrative Medicine. That, that, defines, uh, that defines what hypothyroidism is from the perspective, again, of, of United Medicine. So it is a condition where the thyroid gland is underactive and unable to produce a thyroid hormone. It's pretty straightforward. Now, it is important to understand when we do this type of work that there is a link between the way it's presented, like Hilary Farras el and the term hypothyroidism, okay? Because the description of hypothyroidism as such, or as such in terms of as perceived as a medical disease, it's not directly found really in any United text to the best of my knowledge, and that's what the, the, this article also indicates. But 
from a symptomatological standpoint, both signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism resemble the clinical manifestation associated with swim massage baridmadi, so which we could interpret as a derangement in cold temperament. Okay, temperament again in as in humor such as plethora, infila, excessive salivation, uh, tiredness, excessive sleeping, uh, cold skin, loss of appetite, etc. So see how the the analysis is in part um, superimposable to the current one from the Western standpoint and in part is to be in reinterpreted. So these signs and symptoms are the result of, and this is the point, of an excess in abnormal flan, okay? in the body. So the, this article attempts to identify the observation in the, in the uh, literature. And then, you know, there's a few, um, there are, there are a few, um, few uh, notes that uh, that um, re refer to to uh, the um, prevalence pathophysiology etc etc now we we mentioned that the concept of derangement temper temperament this is and my apologies for for my pronunciation of, of, of Arabic here I'm, 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 I'm doing my best here I'm definitely a uh, more familiar with uh, uh, indoor European phonetics so you know with with um, Semitic ones, so I hope you, you, you'll forgive me for that. So anyway, this, this derangement is an imbalance. Okay? It's an imbalance of this temp temperament, which, of course, indicates that, 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 that an organ develops in a way that uh, it indicates that it has a cold nature. Okay? So um, the cold, cold temperament, from this perspective, can be indicated by various alamas, so again, symptomatology, signs, symptoms such as excessive sleep, loss of appetite, etc. So what, what, what are the causal uh, factors here? Well, this derangement um, is mentioned in traditional texts, Yunani traditional texts, um, as alteration in the asbabe sita zauriah, so the six prerequisites for existence, including abnormal phlegm, I don't even try to pronounce that in Arabic, <laughs> abnormal phlegm, uh, debility of brain, and I really like to mention in, in this context the, the fascinating etymological connection between uh, debility, uh, debilitation, debility in, in Slavic languages, uh, bile, they're, they're fascinating aspect that uh, I would not use the term proof, but very clearly indicates a, um, a common understanding uh, from, from a clinical perspective even, that stems from um, closeness of Indo-European um, um, uh, taxonomical frameworks, okay? So, debility, bile, 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 stability, debilitation, etc. So again, abnormal phlegm, debility of brain, debility of liver, splenic debility, renal debility, anemia, sedentary life, okay? and many, many others. So those are causative factors, the reasons and then you also have risk factors. So from the perspective of integration, those two should be both included. So what does United literature have to say about the risk factors uh, for hypothyroidism? Well, they include a deranged cold temperament, uh, visit diet, drinks with cooling effect, very similar, by the way, to the exact same um, risk factor um, that you can find in traditional European medicine that we just mentioned uh, from... from um, modern um, Heilkunde all the way to um, the, the, the founding the founding mothers and fathers uh, through through uh, Hildegard von Bingen for instance all the way to uh, Hippocrates really and Galen etc um, so uh, all of these are risk factor that are uh, um, that can be uh, primary or secondary elements and comorbid issues so how how do you uh, how what what is the, the the treatment in this context? So you have a diagnosis based on Ashna's Ashra, so the ten categories of signs, and then you, you need to follow the Yunani system principle of, of treatment. Okay, um, so abnormal temperament, six prerequisites of existence, and the main focus, of course, is restoration, rebalancing, bringing back to healthy baseline, which is very much the same terminology you can find elsewhere outside of the Yunani world, outside of the Greco-Roman world, the European world, you can find it in traditional Chinese medicine. And then you have the specific uh, treatment, ilaj, um, which is 
based, of course, on the principle of contradiction. And again, very, very similar to what you would find in Taoistic literature, right? So there are uh, four treatment methods with diet therapy, regimental therapy, pharmacotherapy, and then manual therapy and or surgery. Again, focus on the um, usul bilzid with the principle of uh, contradiction. So there are parallels between how we interpret conditions such as hypothyroidism in the current scientific, evidence-based Western literature and the way it is interpreted in United literature. The important thing is understanding how these signs and symptoms can be similarly or differently categorized as part of the same causal factor or the same uh, principle of um, pathogenesis. So in, in the end, the diagnosis... Uh, that you can find in the United literature, the, the Sumizash Barid Bafami, seems to be quite, uh, if not similar, but at, at least resembling uh, the, the one of hypothyroidism in conventional uh, medicine. And this is one of the interesting aspects uh, that we should embrace. When we talk about integrated medicine, we also need to integrate perspectives in the strictly etymological sense of the term. So we need to see things from different angles, okay? our scoping ability. And seeing means the ability to be extremely mindful of one's own confirmation bias, but at the same time, avoiding rejecting the type of connection between the dots that we should actually see. Again, those are really just examples that I, I hope will, will stimulate uh, the, the conversation we'll have uh, later on today. Um, and again, by no means I mean to um, summarize uh, Unani Medicine or even a small part of um, Avicenna's work in this context, especially in front of, of such a, um, um, a wonderful crowd and you know in the presence of, of, of Dr. Amri. Um, but again, th this... Um, appreciation for similarities is in itself diagnostics, is in itself part of proper clinical decision making. Another example that I could uh, I could refer to in this context without without any bibliographical reference to uh, peer-reviewed materials now, but just from a, um, um, an examination standpoint, uh, is how uh, words and concepts flow, literally flow, across uh, space and time between uh, Avicenna's perspective and perspectives that are um, originating in the Greco-Roman world. And by Greco-Roman world, I, I would also uh, refrain from uh, adding too many uh, ethno-cultural aspects to it. Um, I want to mention in this context that the phenomenal work by, by a um, Bulgarian scientist, archaeologist, anthropologist, um, philosopher, theoretician, uh, historian, uh, Alexander Fold, um, uh, F-O-L, um, um, especially in the context of, of, of the Thracian cultural framework uh, and its relationship to Hellas, to, uh, to the Greek world, to the Roman world, uh, to the Hellenic world in general, and the neighboring um, um, cultural framework. Think about uh, Alexander uh, Macedon, Alexander the Great, and of course, you know, Persia. Um, and so one of the, the aspects of, of his, uh, his approach uh, is, is predicated upon the, uh, the understanding uh, that our modern interpretation, and by modern I really mean probably from the mid-1700 with the German first and then French uh, um, historiography, and the way we, we utilize certain terms, for instance, the separation or um, assumed identical notion uh, between the concept of Indo-European and Indo-Germanic. Another example of this would be how we use in the United States the term Caucasian, which is <laughs> a very big misnomer to define uh, a, a um, phenotypic um, um, approach to culture, which is in itself um, quite an unscientific way to uh, approach history. But again, uh, from the perspective of Alexander Fall, in, in this can, in this sense, culture is pretty much connected to the, the paideia in the Greek term, to what the uh, active philosophy, the active culture is, 
So to some extent, there is a separation between the um, the, the chivas, the civilitas, civilitas, the civilization from the Roman world, okay, which in its sense uh, represents uh, a, a, a distinction between what happens in the pagus, the the the, the uh, more rural environment, the rus, the the, the, the overall. Um, general uh, population as, op as opposed to what happens in the city, in the civitas. And Rome, of course, is the best example in that sense, which is not necessarily an ethnocultural one, given that you know you have emperors from, from, from Northern Africa, for instance, and are part of the, the, the exact same cultural frameworks. Think about um, uh, Scipio, Scipione or Scipio um, uh, Africanus, for instance, or, or the fact that there are some, some um, uh, research within the field of historical linguistics for instance, about the way um, uh, the uh, North African uh, Romance languages express themselves, all the way to possibly the uh, the conquest of the um, of the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula modern-day uh, Spain and and, and, and Portugal, um, from the so-called Moors at the time, and the pronunciation that might have been actually a pronunciation that was either linked or entirely uh, linguistically speaking. A Italic language, a Romance language, very very close to the ones uh, spoken in the Italian Peninsula. An example of that is the pronunciation of os versus os. So the separation between bone and the separation between mouth, and the, and the many um, jokes about of the time about um, the North African Roman Italian pronunciation um, of these two terms that of course caused a lot of confusion between what was oral and what was uh, osteopathic, we could say. So within this cultural framework, uh, what are some examples of the usage of this term? Well, I would like to use the term pneuma, pneuma, and ignis, or ignis, okay? Because there are, there are, there are, there are, there are the two parts of the spirit, okay? Uh, also in a etymological uh, sense, going back to the ghost, geist, um, from the Germanic standpoint. So if we think about that and we apply this understanding to Avicenna, we find that the uh, diagnostic framework is extremely, not just relevant from an anthropological standpoint, but correct from a biomedical one. So the spirit is combined by, by what we would consider the, 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 the divine breath, the, the, the pneuma in the context of giving life itself which has qualities, okay? It's, it's, it's separated from the psuche in, in, in Greek, okay? Um, it's, 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 it's pulsating breath, it's, 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 um, it's warm, it's, it's clean, as in the, um, in the, in the European um, uh, root, uh, alb, albos, alb, okay? You can find that in, in Elbasan, for instance, with Albania, you can find that in, in um, Alba, in Scotland, etc., etc. It's light, it, it's, it's flowing, it's mobile, okay? That's the pneuma. And then you have ignis, ignis, okay? Ignition, think about it. That is the heat itself, it's the fire, okay? So from a strictly, um, not even biomedical, but just chemical perspective, we know that fire cannot exist without air, okay? So ignis does not exist without the existence of, of, of pneuma, of pneuma, okay? And it's also pulsating, okay, pneuma is pulsating, think of, of the, for instance, the Italian term for tire, okay, tire, the car tire, the pneumatico, okay, um, or think of a medical term, pneumonia, okay, associated with breath, okay, so fire does not exist without breath. And this is entirely um, uh, aligned with uh, United Medicine, okay, so from this perspective, we don't think of uh, esoteric terms only, okay, and, and I use this as a, as a criticism or, or as, a, as a supposed criticism that some in the more materialistic reductionist um, part of evidence-based science might have. So according to United Teaching, each organ needs its function in a higher sense. Function in a higher sense is the spirit, right? So it, it needs its spirit in order to produce an outcome, in order to actually act what it's supposed to act. And this is, again, ph phenomenal because it's really outside of the, the scientific methodology. So uh, to attribute to the scientific method 
its own justification is in missing the point entirely. So if each, each organ needs is its specific um, spirit, okay? Uh, and again, let's go back to spiritus. Let's go back to um, Geist, okay? So if they need to, the spirit to function, it's important to understand that there is a distinction between spirits in general, okay? Versus the singular form, okay? So, Numa and Ignis. Again, so interpretation and, and, and the value of the spirit and, you know, things that appear, uh, at least on a surface, quite irrelevant, such as the distinction between singular and plural and spirit and versus spirits, um, it's extremely important, uh, not just from a linguistic standpoint, but because it has straightforward application in the diagnostic tools we utilize, the whole medical decision making, and even what type of therapy we utilize. So uh, I just want to stress this because one of the issues that I encounter over and over again um, is an issue that is embraced by what, at least on the surface, appear to be two opposite camps. One that is entirely pro anything complementary, and the other one is completely against anything that's not standard of care. In the first case, unfortunately, I must say that uh, a lot of these um, judgment are more uh, connected to a question of personality preference um, mixed with lack of current scientific knowledge, or at least profound enough scientific knowledge. Um, and that is an element of, um, I, I, I must use the, the, the diagnostic term, in some cases, I don't want to put everybody in the same category, uh, a, a paranoid persecutory element, as in we need natural medicine because the current medical system is out to get us. I don't want to delve into the area, and I'm not suggesting that this is a complete false statement either, but it's not rationally speaking, a good reason to embrace complementary alternative integrative medicine. On the other camp, uh, the issue of rejecting anything that sounds even remotely complementary, alternative, and integrative appears on the surface to be predicated on valid scientific examination. But the truth is that the scientific examination is, by definition, um, indicative of a faulty interpretation of such texts. And yet again, we are talking about current versus old evidence. If you are missing the point entirely because uh, you, you have an inability to, uh, to understand the text, then you might have an issue. An example of this that I want to uh, just briefly mention is another article, more of a, a review. Uh, it's a review on a homeopathic spagyric therapy of acute and uncomplicated rhinosinusitis, an observational trial on symptom severity in two general practitioner surgeries. This was uh, published, again, in, uh, a few years ago in 2016 um, as a research report for Forsch and Complementaire Medizin um, and um, by uh, the author Schmidt, Kessler, and Scheinhausen that... Um, belong to uh, the, the University of Freiburg, um, the um, European University of Viadrina in Frankfurt, um, and um, the um, Faculty of Medicine um, and the Medical Center of the University. And again, uh, it, it's a really well done study and examination, but again, it presents this issue, uh, uniting the term homeopathic with the term spagyric where the latter, of course, is uh, connected to the Greek and Roman world, as the name implies, and the whole uh, hybrid, uh, in the modern sense of the term, uh, component of alchemical esoteric medicine, with the first one, which is entirely associated with the work um, by uh, Samuel Hahnemann. Now, of course, etymologically speaking with spagyric, the process itself it's not completely different from dilution process in homeopathy. So in that sense, we could say that um, spagyric is associated with that, but the premises are quite different. Okay? So what does this study say? Well, um, first of all, let's talk about methods, randomized control trial. Okay? So 
In this, in this work, patients suffering from rhinosinusitis who consulted two surgeries in, in southern Germany between November 2012 and April 2013 were offered to participate in the study. And the study was approved, of course, uh, by the medical center in Freiburg. And the primary outcome was the severity of symptoms measured with the sinonasal outcome test, um, which is a 16 um, items uh, patient questionnaire, which assess the general uh, feeling the course of disease. And then the secondary outcomes measures, C-reactive protein as well as blood sedimentation rate were also assessed. So you have both the, um, the, the um, survey, the, the, the questionnaire for the patient from the perspective, as well as what we could consider physical, uh, if not patient vitals, at least physical uh, data. So the patients filled in the questionnaires and give blood sample at baseline, T0, measure repeat after three days, T1, and after 10 days, which constituted end of treatment or T2. The recurrence of complaints was assessed four weeks later, um, sorry, four weeks after uh, T2, after the end of treatment. And this, of course, was um, um, associated with another, another, um, another um, variable, so T3. Uh, what remedy were this uh, patient administer? Well, this homeopathic spagyro remedy called Recura, which contains lufopercolata D6, creosome D6, hydraricum sulforanum rubrum D12, echinacea spagyro peca D12, capsicum anum D4, plantago major spagpeca D6, sanicleuropia D6, and tujoxintalis D6. The initial dose was five drops an interval of 30 minutes, which was reduced to three times 20 drops a, a day once clinical complaints subsided. Over the entire 10-day day period, the patient had the possibility to consult their doctor face-to-face -face or by phone in case of any deterioration in condition. So again, um, I'm not here to either uh, defend or promote any homeopathic remedy in this context. I just want to present the problematic um, interpretation of both etiology in a diagnostic sense uh, as the as well as the decision that occurs when multiple terms are merged together in any case what did this paper indicate well 53 patients were enrolled in, in into this trial and in two cases the assessment at t1 resulted in a prescription of antibiotic due to the deterioration of the clinical picture this is exactly the type of uh, outcome we should have always checking in with the patient and monitoring vitals and monitoring other physical signs to make an informed decision, integrated decision. Two patients failed to return at T1 and two more did not reappear at T2. And this in itself is already an issue. So complete data were collected only for 47 patients with a mean age of 36.3 years, standard deviation of 14.43. Uh, um, and 33 of them, equivalent to 67.3%, uh, were female. And so a slight majority here. Now, um, the change in symptom severity were highly significant, showing uh, effect size of D1.08 and D2.42 in T0 versus T2. CRP values increased slightly between T0 and T1, with the equivalent to minus 0.04, not significant, and then declined toward normalization at T2. Also, BSR uh, showed a small increase in the first and the second hour count at T1 before dropping at T2. Um, T0 versus T2, BSR or AD 0.49 with P value um, equal to 0 0.0001. At T2, all 47 patients responded, reported no side effects, again, on a binary scale, okay, so rating yes or no. Also, the general practitioner reported no side effect, sorry, the, the GPs reported no side effect for all 47 cases. Moreover, 43 patients, equivalent to 91.5%, judged the treatment to be effective or rather effective, as well as satisfying or rather satisfying. Finally, at a follow-up four weeks after T2, 43 out of 47 patients, 91 0.5% reported no further problems in the nasal sinuses with three patients or 6.4% reported rarely and just one patient, 2.1%, often recurring problem. Now, regardless of the validity of this specific um, um, research for general consideration, for general applicability, yet again, I want to stress the importance of um, a specific attention that is predicated upon the way the 
treatment is administered and what biochemical and theoretical assumption um, are contained in the very preparation and administration of such treatment. All right, so to conclude, uh, just a few more things. Uh, so we understand the importance of proper interpretation um, in medicine and how what is complementary now might be just standard medicine in the future. Uh, so it is also about discovery. So uncover what's been there before and the knowledge of the ancients, if I permit this term. So um, I just want to mention one more article, uh, this time from um, my team and I, the, an article that uh, is focused on uh, physical exercise, physical exercise and nutrition in the context of mental health um, that has been um, uh, published in the uh, Journal Global Advances in Health and Medicine. Um, and uh, it is, I would say, the one of the many research studies we have conducted uh, in integrative uh, areas uh, toward psychiatry. There is one that we are um, working on now, which uh, will be published uh, hopefully next year. Um, and that is, uh, that is a study that will, will monitor um, what can we do for, for patients that uh, don't have uh, the opportunity to, uh, to use their physical uh, activation, their, their bodies, to feel better. Patients that might have uh, physical issues, they might be bedridden, they might be uh, suffering from uh, multiple medical comorbidities, so they cannot uh, exercise. And the new research will be focused on uh, virtual reality type of exercise, which is quite fascinating uh, because it will be a virtual reality uh, combined with olfactory bulb stimulation, um, we're still, you know, in, in the in the development phase. So um, we'll we'll see how that research is uh, it, it's going to be, and I don't want to reveal too much about it. Um, and, and part of me it has also a healthy skepticism toward it because uh, one thing is to monitor physical activation based on patient vitals and and, and, and uh, empirical evidence, and one thing is to combine. Uh, things that are on the verge of, of, of a brain-computer interface, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although there are a few assumptions that we could probably make uh, about the, the value, therapeutically spe speaking, of the sense of smell. Uh, so the whole olfaction uh, process is very be relevant. So I will keep you posted when we are, uh, you know, advanced with that research. But to conclude today, I just want to mention just a few things about. Uh, this uh, research on physical exercise and uh, um, and uh, how it impacted positively so the patient population was a research uh, that uh, we, we conducted um, here at the or <laughs> up there <laughs> at the University of Vermont uh, Medical Center um, and uh, my, my two main uh, co-researchers were um, Sherry Gates and uh, Emily Ryans. And uh, the main objective of the, of the study was to promote exercise, fitness, and physical health in inpatient psychiatric patients. And the secondary objective was therapeutic management overall, management of depressive symptoms, um, as well as um, a more patient-centered approach to uh, anger, um, generalized disruptive behavior, manic episodes, etc. Uh, and then there was a third objective to promote research in the um, psychophysiological effect of exercise and nutrition um, in social education in combination with psychotherapy. So in that sense, it was a very, um, it is a very integrative approach. Um, what, um, I, I will spare the details. I, 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 um, I will share with you the, the, the paper um, after this presentation. Uh, but as a general description, these were exercise group offered to the inpatient psychiatric population uh, on both units of uh, the uh, psychiatry department at the University of Vermont Medical Center, uh, Shepherdson 3 downstairs and Shepherdson 6 upstairs four times a week, and each 60-minute exercise session consisted 
in a combination of cardiovascular training, resistance training, and flexibility development, inclusive of a free body exercises, stretching, and strengthening exercises, and muscle activation specific fitness equipment such as upright recumbent bikes, ellipticals, standard rowers, and water rowers, push up bars and stands, bows to balance trainers, exercise balls, handheld fitness balls, balance pause, and aerobic steps. Now, what type of exercise do we focus on? Well, we focus on the general recommendation from the American College of Sports Medicine, and we also follow this exercise by a discussion with a psychotherapist on nutrition education. And this nutrition education consists of identifying food groups, clarifying health food, healthy food choices, discussing uh, budgeting perspectives, and developing a meal plan um, to prepare um, meals according to uh, the most recent recommendation in scientific literature. Um, those were all adult patients, uh, so all uh, patients older than 18 years of, of age, uh, 100 patients in this study. Um, and in terms of the type of analysis we performed, there were pre- and post-session surveys that address overall mood, willingness to engage in further education, physical condition, physical fitness, readiness, and movement-based practices, nutrition group attendance, and perceived, very important, body image using a combination of binary responses and Likert type scales with report percentages and p-value from McNamara test and p-value from Wilcoxon signed rank test. So it was a really uh, interesting research, which also gave us the opportunity to really rebuild part of the previous um, exercise room, which was very limited, which is the one a recumbent bike on Shepardson 6 and create a brand new um, exercise and fitness room on Shepardson 3. Um, and the results were, were extremely, uh, extremely fascinating, not because they were entirely, uh, you know, unexpected, you know, in general, the question is, is exercise good for you should be interpreted <laughs> with, with positive values overall. But keep in mind that those were individuals who were uh, suffering from a variety of um, psychiatric and physical conditions that without the opportunity to exercise might have otherwise you know, chosen not to engage with any type of um, social and or clinical interaction in the unit that was spending a lot of time in the room. So there were two benefits here. One, uh, of the fact that the, the physical exercise improved their overall mood. And then uh, conversely, because they felt good about themselves, they felt good about being there and was a positive loop mechanism. So the body feeling good about itself. Um, and of course, this also allowed them to venture into the world outside of the room and possibly, and as the, the research clearly indicated, um, increase the rate of attendance um, of psychotherapy sessions, including cognitive behavioral therapy, delective behavioral therapy, sensitive of care. So just to give you a few, uh, few numbers here, on the Shepardson 3 units to the question, did the exercise group improve your mood? 93.2% of patients responded affirmatively. For are you pleased with the way your body feels now? The positive response amounted to 93.0%, and very similar outcomes were found in the other unit, upstairs, which used to be called the more acute unit uh, in comparison to mood and personality disorders with a 90.6% uh, response for are you pleased with the way your body feels now and 96.8 for did the exercise group improve your mood. A few more things. Uh, uh, to the question, after attending this group, do you think you will exercise more? 97.6% of patients on Shepard 3 responded positively and the totality, so 100% of all patients on the more acute unit Shepard 6 also responded positively. And so this is just one indication of how to properly integrate uh, what used to be truly integrative to standard of care. Now, just because it is at this point common knowledge that physical exercise is good for you also from a psychological standpoint, this doesn't actually mean that this is um, available to patients in any uh in any way as part of their mental health uh, treatment. Also, from a financial and um, social standpoint, it's hard to make the claim to insurance companies that this is extremely beneficial to the well-being of the patient.
Great. So that that was it for this um, uh, second part for the second lecture, and hopefully we'll have the chance to uh, discuss more in, in in depth each of the integrative um, methodologies um, that um, that I discuss in, in in the book, the the medical uh, philosophy book, more in depth uh, later on. Uh, but I just want to thank you for for your for your patience and attention so far. Um, and again, one of the keywords, the key concepts rather, that I hope um, you will all be able to bring home uh, today is that when we study integrative medicine, uh, we are also talking about integrating medicine. Integrating medicine in a translational sense of the term, so applying medicine to the benefit of the people out there. Now, while you can make the claim that this is intrinsic to medicine in general, the very fact that we are more um, aware of the history of medicine, not just from anthropological standpoints, as good, as important as that is, but also from the way the very nature, the human nature reacts to those parameters that are millennia years old and they still inform the way we operate and they should inform the way we operate because again, as we, um, we approach science, science in itself is uh, a, a predictor of developing knowledge. And so as much as developing is not necessarily a progression in a linear manner, it certainly has to do with uncovering treasures that might be hundred, thousand, five thousand years old. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to, uh, to meet all of you and to talk um, to you today. Um, and I wish you the best in your life, career, and uh, therapeutic efforts. Thank you very much.